Hello, everybody, your excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, friends and colleagues. I'm Zainab Badawi. Welcome to day two of the 2021 Ibrahim Governance Weekend, which, of course, because of COVID restrictions, is being held in a virtual format for the first time. But we'll be back in person, I hope, the next time. Now, over this weekend, we are discussing the impact of COVID-19 right across Africa. Now, we've already looked at health. So today, in the second session of the Ibrahim Forum, we're going to turn our attention to how the pandemic has affected politics and society in Africa. And then that's going to be followed by a terrific one-to-one -one between Mo Ibrahim and Charles Michel, President of the European Council. First, let's introduce today's moderator, and it's the renowned journalist David Pilling, who is Africa editor of the Financial Times. Did you like being described as renowned, Renowned. David? It made me smile. Yeah. yeah, there you go. You see, it's, I'm a it's, good it's friend a first of yours. For everything. <laughs> <laughs> You've got a terrific lineup, haven't you, for us today? So, um, without further ado, I will hand over to you. Thanks so much, Zainab. See you Thank later. Thank you very much. Thank you, and uh, and welcome to our audience, which I think is being beamed. Uh, from around Africa uh, and the rest of the world. And thank you so much for our panelists. Um, today, um, we're going to discuss the impact of COVID on the social uh, and political landscape. Now, I know that other panels, one that we've already had, uh, has discussed health. Another will discuss um, the economy. These are, in a sense, the, the more obvious um, uh, in the open uh, impacts um, of COVID. We're going to try and fill in today uh, a few gaps. We're going to look at the less obvious, perhaps the more hidden, in a sense, the side effects um, of the COVID pandemic. Now, I know as a journalist covering this pandemic for the last year, sadly, mostly from London, not exclusively, but mostly from London, um, that we concentrate um, on the big visible things. We, we, we look at, obviously, the number of COVID deaths. We look at lockdowns uh, and their most obvious impacts. We look at the vaccination campaign and some of the difficulties of getting vaccines to Africa that we're all fully aware of. We look at, in the eco economic sphere, we look at growth or lack of it in many cases. We look at the fall in commodity prices, the debt problems. We look at SDRs. We look at the headlines that come out of elections. But in all of that, a lot gets um, missed. Now, much of what we're going to discuss may be disheartening. Uh, we are going to talk about some of the hidden impacts of lockdowns. We're going to talk about violence against women. We're going to talk about perhaps the growth in inequality, in instability and insecurity. And um, we may talk about democratic backsliding, or at least we may discuss whether, whether we can see that phenomenon. So some of this discussion um, is bound to be a little bit gloomy, but also bear with us because we will also look for points of light and I think so our panelists will try and chart paths forward um, uh, um, in this as well. Um, we will turn to our panelists shortly. I'm going to briefly introduce them now. Um, we have a fa fabulous panel, um, some of whom I've met personally before and some of whom I haven't. Um, we have Patrick Youssef, um, the Africa Director at the uh, International Committee of the Red Cross. Uh, Comfort Eero. Uh, who is Africa Director at Crisis Group, and I notice now Interim Vice President, something I think happened during the pandemic. Congratulations, uh, Comfort. Um, we have um, El Hajj Essi, who's the Chair of the um, Coffee Annan Foundation. Laurence um, Chandy, sorry, I'm giving him a, a French accent there. Laurence Chandy, um, Director of uh, Global Insight and Policy um, at UNICEF. And also I'm delighted today that we have um, uh, Abby Chimeles, who is our now generation representative. I'll be introducing him a little bit more um, closely uh, a little bit later. Um, he is, for the moment, he's the, a sustainability researcher and he is the co-founder of Addis Sustainable Life. Now, just before we turn to the live panel, we are fortunate enough to have a pre-recorded um, keynote address from Amina Mohammed. Now, Amina Mohammed needs no introduction, but when uh, moderators say that, they always then go on and introduce. So I'm going to do that very briefly. She is, as all of you know, the Deputy Secretary General of the United Nations. Uh, she is Chair of the UN Sustainable Development Group. And she was a key player in the formation uh, of the Sustainable Development Goals, many of which 
and have been put under tremendous pressure by this pandemic. Let us turn to that, um, that video now. Thank you. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, dear Mo, dear friends, more than a year has now passed since the first case of COVID-19 was recorded on the African continent. African leaders came together with an integrated vision and responded swiftly. It is that same leadership that before the pandemic was bringing hope and prosperity to the region. Africa boasted six of the 10 fastest growing economies in the world in 2019. Life expectancy at birth was rising steadily and progress was also being made in terms of poverty reduction with the absolute number of people living in extreme poverty dropping for the first time in 2019. But the pandemic has reversed many of the development gains that we have witnessed in recent years and made our task of achieving the SDGs by 2030 even more difficult. For the first time in two decades, we are witnessing a rise in extreme poverty. Many informal workers in Africa, the majority of whom are women, have lost their jobs or experienced a dramatic loss of earnings. Schooling closures and digital divides are jeopardizing hard-fought gains in learning, while progress towards gender equality could be pushed back a generation. The inequality in the distribution of COVID-19 vaccines now joins other troubling cracks in our social fabric exposed by the pandemic, compounding the problem of social inclusion and undermining faith in our democracies. Of the more than 1 billion doses administered so far, just 0.3% have reached the world's poorest nations, where only one in 500 people have received a shot, all according to the WHO. In many wealthier countries, this ratio is approximately one in four. The lack of fiscal space caused by the decrease in exports, tax revenues, and foreign exchange earnings, combined with factors such as mounting debt, overstretched medical systems, and limited social protection systems, has restricted the ability of African democratic systems to respond effectively, jeopardizing trust in our institutions and leaders. What then can we do to ensure a brighter tomorrow? First, we must capitalize on the unique opportunity we have to course correct. Decisive action as demonstrated by African leaders throughout the crisis is needed now to ensure that the recovery is grounded in advancing a just transition in key areas such as energy, food systems, digital connectivity and infrastructure. Spurring these transitions and implementing the African Continental Free Trade Area Agreement, a major achievement for the region, will facilitate trade, help reduce emissions, support those who are shifting from the brown economy to create new jobs geared to the economy of tomorrow for Africa's burgeoning youth population. These transitions must also unleash the potential of women and girls particularly in terms of digital connectivity, where they continue to be excluded at a higher rate than their male counterparts. Second, we must increase transparency in decision-making processes. While transparency may not be able to tackle the limitations of a state's capacities, it does build trust, prevents misperceptions, and helps combat corruption. Civil society actors have a key role to play in this regard, in demanding accountability, but also through forums such as these that incentivize good governance and promote strong leadership of integrity across the continent. Third, we need to reignite the sustainable development goals. Through trans though transparency is key, ultimately it is the provision of services that is the most important factor in building trust and making good on the promise we made in 2015. As we recover from the pandemic, we cannot lose sight of the SDGs as they provide the roadmap that will make inclusive, resilient and sustainable development a reality in everyone's lives, increasing trust in government and promoting stability across the continent. No country can do this alone. Just as a virus has affected us all, we need a collective response to ensure no one is left behind and that Africa gets the recovery it deserves. Throughout the crisis, we have seen African leaders raising their voices for multilateralism and solidarity. In fostering such cooperation, the United Nations will continue to be your close partner as we build back together. Thank you. Thank you very much. We're going to go straight into the panel now. 
Um, I'd actually like to start with Lawrence Chandy, um, if I could, because I wanted to go dive straight into the educational losses. Um, I'm sitting here in London, and we're talking about um, how some children have fallen behind um, in Britain and what needs to be done um, to help those children um, catch up and not lose out, not just now, but in a sense for the rest of their lives. Lawrence, can you help us quantify? This is a very difficult subject to get one's hands around. Can you help us quantify, if possible with numbers, um, you know, what kind of educational losses we've seen? And is this a temporary setback or, or are we looking at something worse? Okay, so I think that of all the, the least visible um, effects of the crisis, I think the effects on learning are near, come near the top because you know, it's much easier for us to observe the number of kids who aren't going to school or the number of kid, uh, schools that have been have shut their doors than to actually quantify um, how far children are falling behind uh, on their learning. What we did at the beginning, at, what the global community did at the beginning of the crisis was to look at previous case studies and then, and then try to sort of move from that to doing some, some more sophisticated modeling work. It's only really been in the last few weeks that we're now getting the first real observations of the extent of learning losses in 2020. So I've now seen studies from South Africa, from Kenya, and from Ethiopia um, of showing the learning outcomes at the end of 2020 in those, in those countries for representative samples of, of, of populations. And what you can see across the three studies I've seen is uh, a losses of between 30 and 50 percent of what of the gains you would expect um, kids would have expected to be made over the year. I think perhaps more important than that is to highlight that you can see greater losses for the younger children, for children in rural areas, which may come as a bit of a surprise, and for children uh, who are and for children who are had the who are least proficient, um, so within a, a given class. And all of that adds to the kind of uh, the unequal impact of, uh, of, the, of this crisis. Now, what can be done? I think that those, those losses are, you know, those losses are, you, you can't, um, you can't shy away from them. They're, they're significant and they're devastating. But we're, the last 10 years, in the last 10 years, we've learned a huge amount about the impact of, the positive impact of remedial education interventions. And I think that my understanding of, of uh, is that really a lot of those losses can be uh, won back. So the 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 challenge now is to is to is to start thinking seriously about the kind of remedial interventions that are necessary to minimize so that those gain those losses aren't made permanent. From the evidence that you've seen, are governments thinking seriously about this? I think that. Um, I think there are a number of countries where remedial education interventions have been being uh, put in place and, and, and brought to, to scale over the last 10 years. So I think the answer there is yes, clearly not across the board, but I think we're in a much better place than I'd say 10 years ago in countries experimenting with remedial tools, um, often personalized to individual children. Um, so um, so I, it, it, I, it, look, it's a big challenge ahead. But I think that for a number of countries, including um, I can think of, you know, Uganda being a good example, countries and Ghana as well, countries who have really experimented a lot with um, with teaching at the right level, more personalized uh, education interventions. There's there's certainly a possibility to learn from those um, and to now um, use them across, you know, use them across the whole country to to um, to benefit all children who have missed out over the last year. Okay. I'd like to bring in Abby in a, uh, in a second. Just before, um, I think we have a short video that, um, that highlights some of the discussions uh, that took place at the Now Generation Forum, uh, which happened just a, a few days ago uh, before this event. Um, if we could just show that video, and then I'll turn straight to, to Abby to get his perspective. We should focus our policies 
towards including those in the rural communities. And that should also be at the front burner of our conversations as, as a general African body, African Union, whatever and discussions we're having, we should always look at how we could bring our activism to the grassroots of our communities. In the area of mainstream education, it's not just sending, um, improving the quality of education, but also the responsibility of the government to speed up um, the, like, the review of um, teachers' salaries and um, actually redistributing quality teachers to rural areas. So, Abby, a lot of focus there on rural um, uh, areas, uh, something that, that Lawrence also, also mentioned. Did, did education come up in your, in your discussions and what have you seen on the ground in Ethiopia uh, in terms of educational setbacks or perhaps not? What have, what have you actually seen? Thank you, yes. Um, it's, an, it's an immense honour to be um, representing the Now Generation Forum. As you can see, there's been a lot of discussions on the issue of yes education um, and oh, definitely setbacks but i think the highlight that really stood out for me in terms of um, young people in terms of consume how they consume information uh, kind of change it rapidly especially after um, um, you know we're we're currently living in a era of a digitalization in which uh, we're seeing a highly polarized ways of consuming information and yes, there ha yes, definitely there will be setbacks in education, but at the same time, um, we are observing huge, um, um, diff like huge changes in how we are, uh, as young people, consuming information, and uh, particularly related to the polarization of media. Well, well, again, I mean, we're seeing similar things here in here in the UK. You know, some people have been able to access education remotely. Um, but of course, for that, they've needed good broadband, they've needed devices. Are you seeing a kind of, a, um, you know, an unequal nature of, of those who are able to um, access these new technologies and therefore kind of go on with their education, maybe even enhance their education, and those who don't have access um, uh, um, to that, that equipment uh, and access to the internet and therefore are falling behind? Yes, absolutely. I, I think that's a significant, um, the digital divide has been there even before COVID uh, hit, but uh, I think it has to do with the now, um, we are new see, we're seeing new um, threats to instability in terms of how we're consuming information and uh, particularly related to at, at least to the case of Ethiopian context, which I'm quite familiar with uh, and would like to also uh, present to this panel is that we're seeing rising uh, threats of ethnification of media and the polarization of media and right now we're seeing you know, you know the second largest population in Africa at the brink of uh, destabilizing mainly because how uh, we have this very polar uh, either young people consume information um, and you know how their worldview is shaped by either state propaganda or a very extreme ends, social media. And right. basically people you know, typing from behind their screens and anyone who has access to smartphones. And usually those people who have access to smartphones, uh, political elites tend to rally supports um, of young people behind you know, lines of ethnic um, and identity politics, uh, which is now becoming an emergent uh, threat to instability. That, that's fascinating. Of course, again, we're seeing that all over the world, this kind of siloed nature of information, echo, echo chambers. But as you say, in the Ethiopian context, this has become sort of extremely dangerous. I'm sure we'll, we'll go back to Ethiopia specifically, because this is one of the, you know, the, the big things sort of non-directly related to COVID that's happened um, uh, you know, in this past year. Um, but let me just broaden out a bit. We may well go back to some of these sort of social um, um, elements. But I did want to um, turn to um, elections. Um, um, let me talk to, first of all, um, El Hajasi on, on, on this um, um, topic. We've seen most elections go ahead. Actually, the Ethiopian election was, was postponed with some 
um, you know, in a sense, sort of disturbing implications to that, although it's going ahead, um, we hope, um, um, next month. But most elections happened. Um, uh, however, uh, you know, there was a suspicion that maybe incumbents used COVID as a kind of a cover um, uh, to, to make it easier for, the, for them to, to, to retain power. Um, we have seen term extensions uh, in Guinea, uh, Ivory Coast, um, uh, etc. We saw violence in the Ugandan election, in the Tanzanian um, uh, election. What was your sort of, if, if one can generalize, well, one probably can't, but if one can generalize, first of all, what was your sort of takeaway from the series of elections that we've seen unfolding during the pandemic? Well, first of all, we have to uh, see uh, COVID in the broader sense. And you mentioned, you know, the some of the pillars. Now, the, the health pillar, which is the one based on science, the uh, politics, which is the other pillar, and as well as the activism, those three will always you know, go together. And what pandemics then do is that they uh, reveal, you know, dysfunctionalities that exist, you know, in our societies. So. What uh, we are describing now by talking about elections, you know, should be seen in that light. But at the same time, also in a broader light of democracy. And I think election is only one component of a democratic process, you know, at large. And it's about leadership. It's about accountability. It's about transparency. It's about also holding on to those democratic rules and not try to blame, you know, some other events like shocks and hazards for not doing the right thing. Like you rightly say, some elections were postponed. Some elections, you know, were held you know, despite under very difficult circumstances. But the paradox is, you know, on the one hand, you know, one so we'll say, well, democracy is important. We should still move ahead and then hold elections in times of COVID. But at the same time, we'll be restricting, you know, people gatherings, you know, due to because and then blaming to the COVID at the same time. So what we are seeing here now is not a COVID issue. What we are seeing is a leadership issue. It is a dormant dysfunctionality that has been exacerbated you know, and revealed. And I think one has always to be looking at those very particular signals and then dive a little bit deeper you know, beyond the signals and then you know, see what can be done you know, in the democratic process you know, as a whole in how to prepare for shocks and hazards, how to respond to them and you know, create an enabling environment for a democratic process you know, to happen while protecting people at the same time. And there we have seen a recess, unfortunately, on our continent, recess, a recession of democracy, which also will be leading in a recession and some kind of dysfunctionalities in the elections. And we have to look into the kind of uh, initiatives we are taking you know, to bring back democracy, you know, bring back participation, diversity, activism in a positive sense. And what, that is what the Kofi Annan Foundation is working on through its different programs that I hope we'll come back to during this discussion. Where, where do you see that democratic recession most severe? What are you most concerned about? We've seen you know, tinkering around the edges of constitution so that people can run again. We've seen use of violence. Uh, there was certainly a lot of violence in the Ugandan election, in the Tanzanian election. Um, uh, which saw the incumbents in both cases uh, re-elected. Of course, John Magafuli later passed away, but but we but we saw initially, um, um, you know, violence in those elections. Wh wh which aspects of we've seen coup, a coup, uh, a double coup in Mali? What what is most concerning you? All of them, <laughs> very concerning, All really. <laughs> All of them. I think it is a. Um, you know, I will not have a preference of the worst, you know, so I have absolutely no preference of any of those ones. I think we need to tackle them all together, and there is not a small mistake and a big mistake, you know, here. I think all of them have to be taken very seriously. You name them all. I think the uh, extension of terms, you know, the, by tinkering around the constitutions, that's absolutely, you know, not right. And I think uh, this is going to be pushing people out of the democratic process. And then if people have no room and no space to express you know, their rights, you know, they will be coming to be using other means that will be challenging us you know, in many ways. And we start seeing that. 
So we are very concerned, you know, about also, as I said, well, we are democratic and then we have to hold elections, but well, we have a pandemic, then we have to restrict movement of people. We have to restrict, you know, gathering of people. Again, people be getting disenfranchised and their rights are you know, being violated. We are not taking into account, you know, activism in a positive sense and not hearing the voices and the messages that the young people are sending, you know, to us in a continent where in some countries up to 70% of the whole population is younger than 35 years. And that can be, you know, as a, a dividend that we can build on. It can be a curse, you know, if we do not take into account, you know, what needs to happen. But again, having a democratic space where rights are respected, where leaders are trusted, where active citizenship is exercised, and the enabling environment, you know, for the expression of the different views and the culture of tolerance and then respect, that is what is going to be leading us, you know, to where we would like to be. Any mistake, even if we consider it small in that context, we can come back and pay big time. Okay, let me bring in comfort. Um, we did see one sort of decent election. Ghana was not a bad election. It was contested. I know it's, I think, still trundling through the courts. But, uh, you know, but this, this, this looked like a properly contested um, uh, affair. Is, is, is democracy in Africa very difficult to talk in such general terms? But is it a glass half full or a glass half empty uh, at the moment? Uh, glass half full. I mean, we, we have come a long, a long way. We can't, we can't deny um, that there has been sort of progress, um, especially from the 1990s, and you know, coming from Nigeria, a country that was under military rule for for a succession of, of years, and you know, the, the conversation is timely, David. When you hear the various headlines coming from Nigeria, um, some politicians calling for some kind of return of martial um, law usurping the constitution. And I think most people, when you speak to them in, in Nigeria, would, would, would rail against the idea that we would go back to the pre-99 days as well. So I think the picture is un, uneven. You know, we've got pseudo-democracies. I mean, what worries me um, is the, the one region that we thought that was, you know, going down the, the right path or, or demo, the, the democratization path, um, West Africa, we are seeing some backsliding um, in that region. You talked about, um, you know, two coups in nine months um, in Mali. Um, you know, you, you mentioned Ivory Coast as well, and you mentioned Guinea. And this is a region where there's been significant international investment, either in the form of the UN, the Kofi Annan Foundation itself has invested considerable time um, in West Africa. Um, ECOWAS as well, all for, for a long time, consider the leading champion on the continent you know, for for democratization, for conflict resolution. So I think this is a this is a worrying time um, in West Africa in terms of safeguarding, um, protecting, and shoring up a number of countries that began to take that important democratic route. Um, Liberia is back on the agenda in a way that I think would worry a lot of people who invested considerable amounts of time um, to to stand up that country as well. So I think the picture is very, very mixed, very uneven. I mean, it is a continent of 54, 54. And I think the other concern, David, is that there is an arc of violence um, coupled with transitions in a number of countries that we thought were taking a good path. So um, Abby's already mentioned um, Ethiopia. The other one that we should we should put on the table is Sudan. You know, that that process is is looking fragile. And of course. The country that was supposed to be the gendarmerie for the international community, the, the protector for the international community, Chad, is now going through a very um, um, difficult um, transition. So, the, the picture is is not looking is not looking good. It's not it's not it's worrying. But out of there, you know, we can cite the Ghanas, we can cite South Africa, we can cite you know countries like uh, Mal Malawi as well and Tanzania as well. You know that. That you know, one take country that was headed by a COVID denier. Hopefully, um, we may see a, 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 a turnaround. So you know, for now, there are concerns, but there are also some rays of rays of hopes. I, I, I should say. Okay, there are some topics there I'd like to go into more more deeply um, if we have time, which I think we will. Um, but I just want to turn to uh, Patrick um, now. 
and, um, and talk about um, um, the humanitarian efforts. As I said, we will go back to security, but for the moment, can you talk about you know, how your own programs have been affected and you know, whether you see um, some programs having been a kind of a casualty, I guess, of the, of the pandemic, of wh where you see the, the problems and perhaps potential dangers? Um, well, first and foremost, thank you very much for offering me this space with such a distinguished uh, um, members on the on the panel. From the ICRC perspective, I think the answer was that because we do work in uh, local uh, local settings and we do work with local organizations such as Red Cross and Red Crescent uh, national societies we have, in a way, increased our output, increased our outcomes uh, because of the pandemic. And as my, uh, our mentor and friend, uh, Al-Hajj Assi, has said, COVID was not only a revealer of weaknesses, but mostly an accelerator of trends. We know that the, th the threat is very real and uh, will, will have and has already, as witnessed on the ground, uh, has been devastating for areas affected by conflicts and violence and where the healthcare systems are weak. But we all agree that beyond the predicted fatalities directed by COVID-19, we are all concerned about the knock-on effects, about the secondary the reverberating impacts on the people's welfare and security at large. So here, and we've seen it in many contexts, political, economic shakedowns at local level, but also these will be probably or should be anticipated as they only increase if we follow the logic of revealer and accelerator. Again, just take the example of health, which we discussed in length yesterday during the first panel. COVID has put additional strain on existing infrastructure. But just imagine the north of Burkina Faso, which lost over 100 health facilities with over 140 operating at minimal level. And here, we need to wake up and see that this acceleration is devastating. I will mention a lot of positive aspects that were triggered because of the pandemic, but I have to focus for the purpose of this panel on the challenges and vulnerabilities. And here, we, look, we really, really not to, need to look at the impact of household welfare that was constrained even further. We as ICRC have been really concerned for those people we call off the grid. As you know, Africa hosts over 29 million refugees and internally displaced, 25 million. Last year only, 4.8 million, a record time for Africa, of people internally displaced, mostly in DRC, in Ethiopia, record times in Burkina Faso, sharp increase in Mali and in Libya are certainly worrying with, as we all know, the impact of conflicts, particularly on women and children, which only in South Sudan and Nigeria form 80% of those who need humanitarian assistance. But if we go deeper into the mandate of the ICRC, and let me relate to that mandate and say, over 60 million people, according to our study, show that, show that people, 60 million people live in areas not controlled by government uh, entities, are basically run by non-state owned groups where logistics, travel permissions, availability of electricity and cold chain, refrigeration, but access to vaccine is simply difficult. And these countries in conflict might, ha might have inherent challenges for vaccinations such as, again, the lack of cold storage capacities, food health, but simply access. Just take the example of Mozambique, uh, where 71% of health facilities were completely closed in the nine most conflict-affected uh, areas in Cabo Delgado in the north. More than 17 districts were uh, touched with 700 health personnel that had to flee their places of work due to insecurity. These are simply statistics just to give us an impression of how difficult this was. And let me ask this question for all the audience. Did COVID-19 freeze or fuel continuing conflicts and other situations of violence? I think the answer is simple. The impact of COVID has been particular hit for the people and communities affected by war. And just imagine that from in many places in the world, 
we've conducted, uh, conducted a study from March to December 2020, which I can share even further results of which, uh, took, took place in, in many parts of the world, but more specifically in Nigeria and Central African Republic as cases studies, where the narratives that we collective embody the, what the combination of COVID-19 and armed conflict really meant for people in crisis. And I have to say, we brought a lot of compelling stories for imperative for change. They are a lot of positive, but let me say one word simply to, to uh, summarize this report, which I can share a few, a few lessons at the end if I have time. One year on, a key to overcoming this pandemic is clearly the vaccination capacity and the continent to start producing its own vaccination. That has to be uh, parked aside, was discussed last, last uh, yesterday. But leaving behind, again, single communities, which will definitely and unfortunately spread and mutate these viruses that we have seen. While the efforts uh, to defeat the virus uh, and to ensure a vaccination that is as universal as possible, we need to wake up and see what the crisis of today has gone away with. And for the countless of people that we're trying to serve at the end, crises did not succeed one another. They simply accumulated. There's an IRC report that says out of 10 humanitarian crises, we need to focus on for 2021, six are in Africa. And I'm sure the ICG report and my friend Comfort Arrow will go into manner, granular details on our own perspective. When we know conflict resolution efforts were stalled and hampered, as indicates your annual report, Las Palmas in the north of Mozambique, parts of Burkina Faso were seized by armed groups, a situation in Ethiopia that is highly controversial. Darfur al Janena or Jabal Marra is not living in its best days. A Mali, a coup on a coup. For God's sake, a president of a republic died at the battlefield. That is only in the last few months. So protracted crises and sudden emergencies unfortunately keep ham hampering all efforts to bring positive change into the landscape. And we are in 2022. Yes. We must not only carry the collective pre-endemic efforts, but really drag them into the future and be proud of organizations like the Africa CDC, which indeed has played a major role as a pan-African organization, which we really need to support. Let, let me interrupt and you. Maybe you let me conclude simply. I'd, I'd like to bring in El Hadj, if I, if, if, I, if I may. You know, this has been a very worrying, to put it mildly, situation that has erupted um, in Ethiopia. I was reading a very interesting report, actually, by Comfort, just as I was coming to this, Su suggesting that COVID may have exacerbated this because of the postponement of the elections and then the elections went ahead in Tigray province. Um, clearly, you know, th this is not the whole explanation for what has happened in Ethiopia by any means. But, but how do you assess the situation? How, how, how worrying has this been? Well, I think the... Uh... <laughs> We can blame so much not on COVID, you know, nowadays, not as well, you know, frankly. But uh, building on well, what uh, Patrick was saying, because uh, it reveals, because though it exacerbates and it accelerates. So if we look at it from any of those angles, and I think you know we could find a beginning of an explanation, but that would not tell the full story. The full story is really that uh, kind of a situation. You know that was there the kind of a conflicts you know that were dormant the kind of dysfunctionalities you know that people have been living on the denial you know of a situation you know that was really looming for quite some time and the incapacity of uh, leaders to find political solutions to political problems and i think that's what we are experiencing now in in, in many places so what are we expecting leaders you know to do particularly political leaders find political solution to the political problems. We are doing the best you know, we can, and Patrick and our friends of Red Cross and Red Crescent are doing a marvelous job, no doubt about it. But the people that we are serving, they're crying for peace. They're crying for normalcy. And are they really crying for their own dignity to go back you know, to you know, being the proud fathers, mothers, brothers and sisters that will not, are not being reused you know, to uh, recipients, you know, of uh, humanitarian assistance. And that's, unfortunately, the kind of situation that we are seeing now. 
So leadership matters, active citizenship matters. And I think we need to use all the means that are being now negatively deployed, you know, for good use, be it, you know, the internet, be it social media, you know, the digitalization within which, you know, we are, all those, you know, can be turned into being part of the solution rather than the problems, you know, that we're seeing. And in part of solutions, I think, you know, we, for example, there are many initiatives that are going on that would be worthwhile building on beyond describing the problems, you know, that we are facing. So young people are mobilizing across the continent. And on one of those initiatives is the one called Extremely Together that the Kofi Annan Foundation is supporting and will be expanding into the Sahel region, which is a big concern to, to all of us. The uh, ECOWAS, you know, is taking some initiatives, you know, there. But we think that, again, civil society participation is extremely important yeah. and we're engaging. So now with them to see what kind of a solutions you know can be found. So preparedness again is extremely important. I'm very sad to say that honestly, many of these problems you know that we are confronted with today, many of them we saw them coming. Yes. And if we are so smart, if we are so smart to see them coming, why aren't we smart enough to prevent you know the catastrophic situation from happening? And yes. this is for me the most important question for HOP and many other you know, okay. dormant crises that we are seeing today. Well, well let, let, let me bring in um, Abby, if I, if I may. I mean, you, you are sat there uh, in, in Ethiopia. You're a young person. Um, you know, you already mentioned some of the polarizing um, uh, influence of the, of the internet and social media. Have your leaders done enough to forego this tragedy? Uh, do you feel let down as youth um, uh, in Ethiopia? How do you see the situation? Yeah, absolutely. I, I feel let down as a young person um, by the lack of leadership and the commit willingness by so-called um, Nobel Prize winners to at least put extended effort to mediate certain, uh, you know, we have seen, yes, as the gentleman previously said earlier on, we have seen these threats coming. They have been brewing for a decade now since uh, it has been inherent, it has been inside brewing, and it's just all of a sudden in 2018 when we all of a sudden opened up the floodgates of, you know, letting, you know, for the first time we had no, no journalists behind bars. We let licenses for uh, media broadcasters, which is good, which is a good step for democracy. But one thing we missed out was that uh, without having the proper infrastructure or the preparation for governing these varied opinions, political divisions, and uh, without having the platforms to moderate these differences in a very constructive and peaceful way, what we have is ultimately, uh, you know, media uh, agencies, political elites forming, rallying people along ethnic and identity politics, which is not helping. It has been brewing internally. I mean, the last. Yeah, as a young as a young person, yes, I feel let down by um, you know the willing the lack of willingness to um, you know see this lead us to pull back from the brink. I guess. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So yes, well, 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 thank thank you so much for that perspective. I'd just like to turn to comfort bri briefly, maybe on Ethiopia, and then we might talk about um, insecurity more broadly. But let me first just ask you about about Ethiopia. Uh, someone who's covered the country very closely and had been extremely optimistic about, about um, Ethiopia, but it does seem to have gone very wrong. Yeah, I mean, it's, you know, the transition is on a, on a very rocky path. Um, you know, what we see now is, is a, a dispute that is deeply founded in the very contrasting visions of what Ethiopia's future should look like. And the, the focus of the international community, rightly, has been on Tigray, but there are other parts of Ethiopia that are in dire straits. And if we, you know, we're talking about conflict prevention, um, if we don't start looking closely at those areas, Aroma, Am um, Amhara, and other parts of the country, we're going to see that the country slide into deeper, into deeper stress as well. You know, and this is weeks before the, the country goes into, into elections. And the current trajectory, David, to just be brutally frank, is more, not less fighting. The resistance is getting deeper. I think we're in for a protracted um, stalemate. Um, Prime Minister Abiy um, declared victory at the end of last November. 
Um, we haven't seen a pause in the conflict. He hasn't been able to solidify the base. Um, the people have become more hardened. And tied to that, the region, this is now an internationalized internal conflict because Eritrea is now involved. And now we're seeing tensions on the border um, with Sudan. So, you know, there are many constituencies of Ethiopia is, dest is destabilizing. And it's alongside that, the region finds itself in, 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 a, in a deep period of entanglement. And, you know, worst case scenario, I don't, I don't wish for it to happen. But now you're seeing just increased um, tension and violence um, right across the horn. Um, and Ethiopia, you know, considered to be the hegemon of the region, su su uh, supposed to be the security guarantor of the region, um, we find that it's not necessarily the reliable partner that most of the international community were hoping that it would be. Yes. You know, and we're likely, David, I think, to see sort of more internal communal violence of the such that Abby is um, talking about when he talks about identity politics and he talks about deep, you know, ethnic polarization right across many, many front, front frontiers. Well, here is an example where I very much hope that you're wrong, but but I hear I hear what you're saying. Let let's let's um, uh, talk about something else that's sort of related in a sense. Um, you know, when we mention the educational um, um, losses. Uh, there's also, of course, unemployment, specifically youth unemployment, um, which can take many forms and have many uh, implications. One of them may be, and it may be a kind of a lazy um, uh, uh, sort of jump, but, it, but, it's, but it's possible that there are links with crime, organized crime, and even terrorism. And we do seem to have seen an upsurge of some of that, I would say, specifically in the Sahel, which seems to be getting kind of nasty by the day. You mentioned, every, um, um, of course, you mentioned um, uh, Chad uh, and, it, and its role and, uh, and how that um, uh, um, has begun to kind of um, go. But there's also no northern Mozambique where we've seen an upsurge um, in violence. Uh, you know, do, are you, do you draw threads between um, uh, the pandemic, unemployment, and these instabilities that we're seeing, uh, or is that too too simplistic? Uh, are you asking me, David? Yes, sorry. Yes, good. Uh, no, I mean, so, sorry. Um, you know, it's, it's true. COVID, and I and I think Patrick said it well, and and um, a lad from Coffee and Anne Foundation said it well. Yes, COVID has been a complicating factor. But let's be um, let's be quite frank. Um, even before COVID, you know, conflict resolution, conflict on the continent was had fared no, no has fared no better. And it's, in fact, it, it you know it's it was there before the pandemic. It will continue post the pandemic because all the ingredients um, that give cause to these conflicts were there regardless of of, of COVID. And also the conflict in Cabo Delgado, Mozambique, northern Mozambique was already in full flow before COVID. It, it has, as, as Patrick said, been a, a, a revealer. Um, it has exposed certain things that we, we knew already. It's, it's sharpened certain things. It may have, um, it may have exacerbated, um, but certainly with or without the, the pandemic, we already had a crisis in Mozambique. What worries me, David, and, and to connect all the pieces, one of the things that we're hoping that Mozambique authorities would learn from the Sahel, for example, from the Lake Chad Basin, from Somalia, is that military, the use of military force alone is not going to get you out of the insurgency. Yes, the use of force is necessary to deal with hard, hardline insurgents, to deal with the more hard, hardened of the jihadists, but there needs to be a strategic shift, as we said, in the Sahel, where you need to have a more co comprehensive approach. There are deep rooted reasons as to why you're seeing fighting in northern Mozambique. There are history of grievance between the center, between the state and, and the marginalized um, in, in north, northern Mozambique. It should not be lost on any of us that a bulk of the fighters in northern Mozambique are young, feeling very uh, marginalized, feeling that the, the resources of that region have been misused, feeling that state corruption, state largesses, um, theft from the northern part of the country has further fueled um, grievance um, between the government and the, the people of that population as well. So for me, um, 
clearly COVID has complicated issues in various war zones, as, as Patrick eloquently showed, but the pandemic has not neither altered nor worsened conf the conflict landscape. Things have continued. It certainly may have distracted people's attention, but conflict has, has, has continued. And I, and I hate to say, David, it may continue to get worse in certain places, especially if we don't begin to deal with those ingredients um, that have been outlined by your panelists already. Just, just quickly, do you think the international community has taken its eye off this? And does that matter? I mean, you know, these are African problems. I mean, maybe international in involvement, for example, France in the Sahel only makes things worse. I mean, this is a sort of a point, a point to debate. But I guess my question is, you know, has the world taken its eye off these problems? And when we wake up from the pandemic, are we going to suddenly find, you know, much worse situations in, in pockets and rather large pockets um, of Africa? I mean, look, that, that, that question about whether the international community is taking as well existed before the pandemic. We always worried about the, the degree of international attention, the degree of coherence, of cooperation among the international actors. So that those realities remain within the pandemic and it will be there once we come out of the pandemic. I think what should concern us, however, David, post the pandemic, is the degree of financial um, wherewithal um, from key um, centres, from key donor centres. And I mean, I hate to say it, the country that I'm talking from, the United Kingdom, already pre the pandemic taken on a very unfortunate decision to cut back its international aid. And we saw what happened in, in Yemen and their question marks about certain parts of the continent. So I think that will be one worry, whether there will be the same kind of international financial assistance to help those countries in most need of help. But let's break down the international community because, you know, in the, for example, in Mozambique, the region is very concerned about what is happening in, in northern Mozambique. Again, this is no longer a conflict that is contained to that country. You know, and that some of the fighters are drawn from the, coming from the region. So, for example, Tanzania. Um, South Africa has got every reason to be concerned. In a matter of weeks, David, there'll be a summit, a SADAC summit. The Southern Africa Development Community meeting to decide whether to deploy troops into that country. So that's a region that is that has been very seized for over a year now, and there's been a push pull between the Tanzanian government, that, um, between the Mozambique government, that is a little bit reluctant to have external um, forces come into that country to deal with that crisis as well. The region is absorbed for example, in Ethiopia. The region is both part of the problem and part of the solution. The Africa Union, if you recall, last year, um, David, declared 2020 as the year of silence in the guns. COVID came, distracted it. It was right to pivot to, to COVID, but it needs this year to get back on track and deal with conflict prevention. The UN also, um, you know, continues, you know, with this, with this Secretary General, and the, the chairperson of the Africa U Union, they've been in lockstep together to keep the Africa issue on the agenda. But the key as ever in all these intergovernmental agencies lies with the member states and the willingness of member states to take seriously the push for conflict resolution, the pu push for crisis prevention. Because as we said, the Kofi Annan Foundation said it very well, it's not as though we, we, we are not attuned to these crises. It's not as though we don't see the indicators coming down the, the path. The problem is that there's a real weak link, weak link between, conf between early warning and early action. That remains the challenge today. And Lawrence, from your perspective, what does this insecurity mean? Well, I, mean, I, think, I, I think what I want to emphasize first is that the, um, the hypothesis you were, sort of, you were uh, proposing there, David, um, Around sort of the around youth unemployment, I mean, one has to recognise that in the African in the African continent, we haven't seen um, tens of millions of young people sitting around idle. Uh, young people have to work; they have to find um, they're, they're they're obliged to to find whatever opportunities they can to make money. And rather, what we're seeing is is an underutilisation of the talent in the continent. So. What you see when you look at sort of uh, youth unemployment data, I think you have to be quite careful uh, given the context. And I think what that reflects is uh, the, a, a much sort of thinner provision of social protection in the continent. So, and, uh, and that has been very apparent, I think, in the last year 
across Africa, where the social assistance uh, interventions we've seen, which a number of governments have rolled out, um, they, most of them are temporary. Um, they've been put in place and quickly withdrawn. There are um, a, lot of, a number of them also relatively small scale. So um, that I think for what I want to emphasize here is that the insecurity is economic and social as well. Um, and and the, um, what, we haven't, what we haven't seen um, through this pandemic is the, um, which we've seen in, in some other parts of the world is this sort of big scaling up of, um, of social assistance programs. Now there are some, there are some uh, interesting counter examples here. So I think in Togo, in Madagascar, in Angola, we've seen programs, um, um, social assistance programs ex extended to many more families um, and uh, including um, uh, um, to parents with, with young children. But until there is a stronger, um, until there's stronger social protection in, in, in place, then I think part of that, an important dimension of that insecurity is that is families having to cope in whatever way they can. Um, there's this kind of headline that we see now and again that, you know, um, uh, that the sort of economic blow, and it is interesting that, the, that this is what's really hit, hit Africa. You know, certainly the first wave of the pandemic has not been as severe. I mean, not yet. Um, uh, but, but what has been incredibly severe is the economic um, impact. And the headline that we see is this has set back, you know, many African countries 10 years in terms of development goals. Um, is there anything in that? Is that too pessimistic? I think I'm going to echo the uh, comments by my, my, my panelists here that the the, the, the rate of progress we were seeing in terms of rising incomes had slowed a lot in the period leading up to, um, to the pandemic. Um, so, um, you know, we should be careful there um, not to attribute everything to the pandemic itself. Um, I do think that the, I think it's, it's an implicit point in this whole discussion has been that um, the, is that uh, Africa cannot, as a continent, will not begin a recovery until, um, until the pandemic is contained. And the longer that wait goes on, the inevitably more shocks will hit um, different countries. Sorry, you want to come in there, David? Yeah, let me ask a slightly different question then. You know, we've seen in much of the world that the relationship between citizen and government has changed as a result of this pandemic. We, we realise, some people realise that, you know, governments can play this important role that society is a thing, it's not all about individuals. You know, we've seen furlough schemes, we saw big, big interventions in South Africa, you know, central banks pumping in money, all sorts of um, areas where, uh, where we've looked to the government. Um, to what extent have you seen that uh, uh, across Africa? We have seen some good leadership in Africa. We've seen some bad leadership, but we've seen some very good leadership. Has there been a subtle shift in what is expected, that, in a sense, the social contract? I'd be interested in what the other panellists think as well, but let, let me start with you on, on, on that one. Yeah, I, I also want to hear from um, my, my colleagues here, but let me offer um, a perspective here. Um, based on some work we're doing at UNICEF with Gallup, we've been uh, conducting a, a large global poll looking at attitudes of younger people and, and comparing them with an older cohort. And some of the things we're seeing, which I think are especially striking, are um, when we look at young Africans, and this is based on seven countries who are included in our, um, in our poll, uh, young people um, are, are very optimistic about the future. Um, um, which is um, really quite striking, strikingly optimistic still. Um, young people also in, Afri in, in the African countries in our poll are, um, uh, see themselves more citizens of the world than uh, citizens of their country, uh, much more so than the older cohorts who we polled in those countries and compared to um, uh, equivalent, people of an equivalent age in other countries. So. I think that I, I, I want to leave it to my um, to um, the other um, uh, experts here to give a view on on how um, 
on how the pandemic has shaped this. But I think the most important point here is the intergenerational difference. I think the different attitudes of young people here is really key to understanding how the social contract is being, um, is being really put to the test and the demands young people have um, of, um, uh, of the state. I think that they're, I think the views of the younger generation are, 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 are frankly quite different to, their, to that of their parents. Well, I have to bring in Abby here, clearly. Um, do you recognize that picture? Do you recognize that optimism? I'll ask you about the government in a, in a second. I mean, obviously, you need to see through the fog in a sense of Ethiopia at the moment. But do you recognize that, that, that description of, of youth across the continent? Yes, um, the optimism is there. Uh, absolutely. We, uh, the, you know, we, we, we we're seeing very tough times um, and not just in Ethiopia and across as um, all over the all over Africa and we're seeing um, very gloomy pictures, but at the same time, we're optimistic because we also rely on the international community and the African community and its diaspora in making sure that we pay attention to what is really uh, the key areas we need to focus on as challenges so we need to acknowledge first. First of all, young people, as a young person, you know, representing the voice of young person in this panel, I would, I would absolutely like to make certain to you that young people are changing on how we are expressing our frustrations, our aspirations. We're not just waiting for elections, you know, that come in just five years and whatnot uh, to actually, you know, tell what we want to happen. We're doing it constantly, uh, every day through how we interact on social media, on, you know, on protests, the nature of protests by themselves are changing and the whole civic activism movements are changing. And it has a lot to do with, um, you know, the, the, the only challenge is that when we young people fear that their aspirations are threatened, uh, we need to have healthier ways of expressing and channelizing um, these frustrations and make sure that they're heard, telling them that it's heard. It's not going to be solved overnight, but there needs to be smart and effective ways on how we uh, present these challenges. And, the, and for me, the, what we're looking at as a civil society, as part of uh, the African Artists Peace Initiative, for example, as a network, what we're looking into is how can the arts and creatives and uh, creative communication, cultural diplomacy can be tools for voicing the concerns of young people in a healthy and more constructive way. This is the optimism that we're looking into that hopefully, you know, I mean, the crisis group has been warning us about the situation for years. We have not paid attention, politicizing the issues. We're holding a particular ethnic group accountable for the collective failures as a nation we're having. This is very detrimental to democracy. Um, but at the same time, I, I'm, I'm happy to see that, you know, the under, yeah, the underutilization of young people, it's true. Young people being idle and then being rallied into these movements is true. It, it is a concern, but we haven't looked into, you know, uh, the creative industry, how, how we can leverage, you know, the potential of creative people in, in engaging them into, you know, Yes. Um, yes, we need manufacturing. Yeah, so I'll just cut it short here, but I'll probably mention a few things we see as a solution in terms of how we govern media and internet later on, perhaps. Okay, well, what I was going to, because I'm fascinated, so I actually wanted to follow up. What I wanted to ask you was, what do you want from government? You know, can, are you able to define what you see the role of, 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 of government, um, you know, as well as to be elected and then to leave when they're, uh, when, when they're kicked out by the voters, but, but want, when they're in power, what do you want government in terms of, what do you want it to provide, what do you want it not to do? do, you, how, do you, how do you see that social contract? Governments need to be honest with the challenges they're facing. Um, they need to be honest with the international community and um, they should not fall into the mistake of, um, you know, you know, rallying people into this one side, you know, the previous government versus the current government kind of, you know, this is my turn to rule, not yours kind of. We should avoid by any chance. So in short, I would really want to see how private media, research-based media, 
could inform young people into more nuanced and more informative ways of of um, of shaping their reality of uh, communicating their aspirations. Not everything has to be contentious and uh, long identity politics. There's so many challenges where socioeconomic challenges um, that we're facing as a continent, and it's not everything has to be so. In, we need to create more space where. Uh, private media, for example, could creative communications can inform young people of the actual realities, like the more, more challenging realities uh, across the continent. And I think the best way uh, we can do that is by involving, you know, movements and um, uh, validating the lived experience of young people as knowledge, as research, and incorporating that into the decision making. Yeah. I, I, yeah. Sorry. Just very briefly, because you know you've mentioned this kind of you know the the, um, the sort of ethnic silos that you're seeing in Ethiopia, but we've also got this you know we, we've just heard that there's a kind of a, a Pan African feeling and, a, and an internationalist feeling. Is that something that you also recognise that people are looking beyond their own borders and feeling a sense of solidarity around the continent and even around the world? I wish if we looked more beyond our borders and see the greater role of, um, for example, what Ethiopia upholds as uh, as for the continent, the leadership, or like the the aspiration it has for even people in the Caribbean and uh, the diaspora. And if we, if people, including Ethiopians themselves, see young Ethiopians see, could see their place in these larger uh, dynamics, the global dynamics, I think we would be at a more uh, better will be more positioned to see our internal conflicts as very, you know, insignificant if that perspective was there. And that's what we're really trying to push to for young people to see their greater role in these uh, wider pictures. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to go to the front row in a minute. But first of all, I just wondered um, if uh, any other panelists would like to comment on this particular um, uh, issue of, of of youth. I mean, we've heard we've heard from youth. Um, but Patrick, perhaps, do, do you have anything to, to add to what you've heard? Um, well, yes, I, you know, we've all been sitting on these, on these huge events, huge conferences and uh, trying to contribute while we all know and just, uh, just want to be very transparent here, again, uh, with the, with a foundation that looks at one of the very few organizations in Africa that looks at the initial and further deep question of governance, the question that relates to treating the root causes of crisis. We all acknowledge that COVID is one of many now, something on top of. I've visited the north of uh, Ethiopia, went to Pemba. I was in Mogadishu a few weeks ago. And all people relate to are questions of one trust and around the main reasons why these crises keep on hampering any progress uh, without looking at these huge pockets of fragility on the continent beyond Kigali, beyond Pretoria, beyond Dakar today. We saw by the pandemic that if we don't treat holistically the problems of governance and problems of that, that lead to further crises that impact today the rise of the young generation in Africa, which is not only the future, but I'm sure the solid basis for a prosper Africa, we won't be able to deal with a continent that has immense riches. And I would like to add two things that emerged from last from yesterday's panel, which I think are extremely important. And that was on the growth or the, the reinforcing, the strengthening of the health systems in Africa. One is inclusivity, is looking at how to be as inclusive as all the areas that are touched today and all the different expertise that are lacking in the continent. Yesterday, Mo Ibrahim said himself, a Sudanese, the first Sudanese death uh, in UK, uh, the first death in UK was a Sudanese doctor. And there are so many capacities and competences on the, on the continent that we need, I think, to harness collectively, but starting with governments. One, as I said, inclusively, and second is sustainable. And again, looking beyond the vaccination problem that we have today, 
which will certainly be a subject of intense deliberations in the coming weeks and months and probably years to come, we need to think quite quickly long term how to engage development actors, how to bridge between humanitarian and development and seek that in, in, uh, in opposing in a position to alleviating the suffering of people who have been there since 36 years in Mogadishu living the same problem, how to improve their lives, how to bring positive change into their landscapes in, in order to bring trust not only in local governments, but also in the international system that only can complement local efforts on the ground. Okay. Elhad, just briefly, and I'm going to come to comfort also and then go to the, uh, to the front row, but this question of the social contract, I mean, things do change during these big moments of global crisis. Young people clearly are a kind of a force. We saw it in Uganda. Uh, you know, we've seen it all over the... We saw it in Sudan, young people becoming a force that, in a sense, ousted a, ousted a regime. Um, do you see a kind of a reconfiguration of the social contract, or is this too sort of airy-fairy? Am I seeing things that don't, don't really exist? Yes, I think Abi was so eloquent, and I really don't want to alter what he said. And I think, you know, he gave us, you know, a very, very clear, you know, views, you know, on that. And, but I want to put that in a broader context of uh, how communities, you know, at large are also responding to that and the social contract between communities and then those who are governing and then those who are leading. And COVID, again, you know, is a very important lens through which we can look at that. Well, the resilience of communities on this continent has just been phenomenal. You are asked to wash your hands, you know, to prevent, you know, infection where there, where there is no water. You are asked, you know, to wear a mask. And then when masks were costing at the time, you know, 80 cents of a dollar, where people will have to live on a one dollar a day, you know, you are asking you know, to go and then look into right now, get vaccinated when 0.3% of the available vaccines are only available on the continent. I had COVID myself and I had very severe COVID. And I know what a weak health system is, but I know what strong health workers, you know, means as well. People working under very difficult circumstances, you know, making miracle, you know, saving people's lives, you know, including my own under the difficult circumstances. And I think weak health system does not equate to weak health workers. What we have, you know, is systems, you know, in place that needs to be strengthened or even put in place because honestly, in some of the places, it's simply not existent. And that is always, you know, in those very remote communities in where people are most vulnerable, you know, that we see where the problems, you know, are biggest. Well, we all call it, you know, the last mile in our jargons of development, but well, if that is indeed where the problems are biggest, it should be their first mile of response. And I think that's where the social contract you know, has to be rebuilt again, a cohesion be built, social capital be further promoted, but it has to be based on trust to leadership, responsible uh, leadership and active citizenship, which then boils down to one thing, leaders have to deliver on the promises they make you know, to the people. And I think we can kind of talk, talk about governance in many different ways, social contracts in many different ways, but deliver on the promise, build trust, and have active citizenship. That is the bottom line. Some very strong points there. Comfort, just two minutes, and then I want to bring in Mo, if I can. Yeah, I mean, David, you asked about, Abby, about demand and what the youth um, want. You know, Prime Minister Abby came in articulating a number of the things that um, Ethiopia's citizenry wanted. Um, and he, he came in on a response to a quite clear street protest that wanted to see change um, from the previous um, um, ruling coalition. And he promised liberalization. He promised that in a political space, um, economic liberalization as well. So we do have to ask ourselves what went wrong in Ethiopia, for example. The second point I think I'd like to, to make, David, is that on the social contract, and it's good that Ahad from Kofi Annan said, you know, you can use whatever language you want. It still boils down to governance. Um, you know, the, the older generation may still be running a lot of our countries, but the country's profile is young and getting younger every single time. And that generation is getting impatient. They've been locked out 
um, from the political system. And there is, despite, and it's unfortunate that there is violence that accompanies a lot of this demand for change. But nonetheless, since the 1990s, David, we have seen continuous and continuous push for change, push for reform. And that has led, that has led to a change in regime. Now, obviously, transitions are often difficult to, to manage. Um, they sometimes get derailed, they go off track, but the thirst for democratization is very clear. The thirst for change is very clear. The thirst for to see a different kind of regime to end the period of authoritarianism, to end the period of dictatorship is very clear. And there will be ebbs and flows. There will be more, there, there's likely to be more violence. But I think the youth are pretty clear on what they want to see changing. And we have seen that continue and to continue. Just one more example, David. Um, Nigeria, the NSARS um, protest, what emerged from there was quite significant. You know, you saw a number of youth, young people across various frontiers and in the diaspora, you know, attaching themselves to the NSARS campaign. And even prior to that, a number of them used what happened uh, with the murder of George Floyd to put a spotlight on the, the, the issues that were going on in their own societies. So not only did they cross arms in solidarity to what was going on in the US, they used it as a moment to call out their own government. And again, for me, these are important um, rays of, of significance, rays, um, they, 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 they shed an in, important spotlight that, that the generation um, of today doesn't want to go backwards, doesn't want to see a continuation of the past, but is demanding change. And we're going to see more protests. We're going to see more you know, thirst and more pushing out um, by a number of youth across the, the board insisting. And finally, David, you'll, you'll remember yourself, um, the outgoing um, Horn of Africa um, um, SG, um, Special Envoy for the European Union, Alex Rondos. He always talks about the three Ds, decentralization, democratization, and demography. And demography is linked to youth. And it's a very clear call. Um, and Abby, I think, was really articulate in, in saying that the demands are very clear. Um, it's livelihood. It is, it is education. It is opportunity. It is a chance to be at the center and a chance to be able to, to, to chart the course of the countries. Um, in which they are citizens of going forward as well. Let, thank let you. me stop you there, Comfort. Thank, thank you. Thank you so much. We've just got a little over 10 minutes left. So I want to turn to Mo, first of all. Philip, you're up next, just so you know. Um, Mo, what do you make of what you've heard of um, uh, this discussion? I was interested that it kind of landed almost quite naturally on youth at the end um, uh, uh, and this, this new force. And, and as a number of people have said, you know, Delighted that we had Abby here to, to articulate that so well. But Mo, what do you make of what you've heard? Uh, I'm really in agreement with what you said. It is uh, wonderful. And I really admire a lot. I, I, was, I sat back enjoying uh, listening to Abby because that's the future of Africa. We're all talking about youth as, as actually it is they're the majority in Africa now. Uh, if you have a party called the party of youth, those guys will win every election, if only to organize themselves. Uh, it's a branding tip from Mo there, anyone yeah, listening? Yeah, you should, you should form a party called the Young People Party. And if everybody joins this party, you guys take power everywhere. <laughs> and that will be really uh, 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 wonderful because our generation failed. And we, we have to accept that. We failed. Uh, uh, we, we, we inherited a wonderful uh, uh, continent and we mis mismanaged, mismanaged the development of our resources, natural resources, mismanaged development of human resources, uh, uh, really we made a mess of it to, and it's time to accept that. Uh, you compare what's happening around us in, since 70 years or 60 years. Uh, past years, uh, you'll see where Africa was, where the other guys were, and who who moved where, and all the time, relatively to other continent and other country, we have moved 
backward. We have to accept that. And uh, then we need to move forward. We need to see, uh, yeah, so what can be done now? We need to get up and dust ourselves and, and get going. So now we hope this young generation will really take the lead. And uh, I always speak against all our geriatrics who are running our countries, and they just never want to go. I mean, you have people 80, 90 years old, you know, still hanging on, on to power, completely disconnected from, and they have not achieved nothing. You know, somebody running Cameroon for 40 years, and what have you done? Nothing. So you should say sorry and, and leave, you know. Uh, let somebody else try to do it. Uh, uh, so I'm, 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 I'm really hopeful. Uh, uh, that our young people who can take us forward. But also, I'm very wary of, of the, uh, the proliferation of the uh, jihadist and uh, all these uncontrolled spaces in Africa, which actually uh, Patrick spoke about and, and a number of people who spoke about this. This is a big problem. To have all these spaces in Africa, which nobody controls, all these weapons around the stabilization of, of, of countries, is totally unacceptable. And then we have those dumb soldiers in Mali. Look, we, we build an army. We give them all this money from our very meager resources give them uniforms, give them tanks, give them weapons, and they should go to the border to protect us. And they still go to the border to protect us and fight those jihadis, they come back to the capital to take power. It, it's just crazy. You know, Mali is undermined by all these terrorists, and it says those guys going to fight for their country, uh, they're coming out, you know, to fight over power. It's just crazy. And uh, this, we need to have really a clear stand in Africa about the role of soldiers. What is the job of soldiers? I mean, like, those guys are shooting at us, trying to control us. What is this? And uh, I'm not this comfortable. Is not yet the norm. Uh, this is still an exception. And, yeah, but we have, we have, we have really to move away. I thought we you forgot thought about military that. coups. Yeah. Yeah. Now they're coming back again. Uh, I'm. Concerned about also the the problem used to be in the Sahara and the, in in the Sahel. Now I look at the Horn of Africa, and it's really destabilized. I mean, we talked about the problem in Ethiopia. You mentioned that yourself, and Sudan is quite fragile through this difficult transition. Chad lost a strong man. You like him or you don't like him? Who's a strong man playing a big role fighting in? all fronts in Africa, but that now left a vacuum. I don't know, don't sure what's happening there. Uh, Eritrea playing a funny game. I know what they think they are. Uh, they've been invited to Ethiopia and as unwanted guests, I don't know when they're gonna leave. It's very easy to invite people into your house, but sometimes difficult to ask them to leave, <laughs> you know? So I don't know if, uh, uh, Prime Minister Abi now regrets asking them to come in, but uh, it's a big mess. And then we don't forget the problem with the dam. We have three countries at, at, at loggerhead, and it's, it's like children. I mean, I, what is the problem? Those guys can sit and sort it out. We need to fill the lake behind this dam. Do you fill it over six years, seven years, eight years? Do we link it to the... Uh, rain intensity of the rain is is not difficult. You and, and you I can sort out and sort it in half an hour. You were sounding optimistic a moment ago when you were talking about youth. Now you've gone into yeah, but all because the old we are not run by you. I mean, because at the moment all, all those kind of uh, 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 we we really need to move forward. And 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 uh, the only area which is deteriorating fast in Africa, unfortunately, is security and de and democracy. Right. And, yeah. Let me, if I could, bring bring Philip in because I I, I was told that he he, you know, had a specific.
point to make, and in a sense, I've kind of le left that. We talked about education. We haven't really talked about women specifically. Philip, I think this is a point that you wanted to make. Exactly, but let me first of all say, David, that was a highly instructive and extremely enlightening discussion. I really enjoyed uh, the discussion between the panelists. And uh, let me make two points here. One I have to make at the beginning is um, I think that never ever Africa has been so much on the radar of Europe and Germany in particular. Um, I think um, we have been looking to Africa never before in such a detailed way. Um, it is, of course, uh, whether we have been successful with our um, missions and, and our engagement in Africa, I think the jury is still out. Um, but, but one thing is true, I think, with the European Union and Germany also, um, Afri African countries, African states have uh, much more of a, a tint and a cooperative partner than before. But I wanted to make that point at the beginning because it was, um, it was raised uh, during the discussion. But my, my true point, and you, re you relied to it, uh, David, is... Indeed, let's come back to what we started, um, where we started, namely uh, when it comes to the education question. And I think that um, uh, this concoction of the pandemic and the, uh, the rise of crises, which was um, mentioned a couple of times ago, I think um, governments somehow get or tend to get, and maybe one can blame them, tend to get, tend to get distracted from from the long lines. And education, I think, is one of the main and most important uh, uh, tasks uh, governments have. Um, and, and in this uh, education uh, chapter, I would say the girl child is, is the most important. We have seen before, before COVID, um, it was in many countries wasn't good enough with, with, with girls. Um, it was in some countries even really bad. But now it is, I think it tends to be much worse. And I think that, and, 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 and I'm happy that Comfort um, brought in this, this, um, this, um, the three Ds by Alex, um, the demography. If you really want to, if African states want to benefit from the demographic dividend, um, any investment um, in, in, in education is highly necessary. You have to get to, to bring up more um, investment, more um, uh, commitment to education, and, and you need to make more efforts in order to get uh, people, um, uh, kids uh, back to school, and especially the girl child back to school. When we see the situation in Burkina, where with the shrinking safe spaces, the growing insecurity, has um, has closed down hundreds of schools is really a, this is really a worrying um, um, development and I think we should do our utmost to get this long line you know get people educated um, in order to uh, make them um, you know being a productive part of society and therefore be a big part of the demographic dividend this is one of our main tasks and I think Europe and Germany stands ready to work with African countries if they wish so on in this matter thank you Thank you so much. I'm reluctant to bring in anyone else because I see the clock is, is ticking down on us. Um, it's going to be very hard for me to summarize um, uh, th this th discussion, which I think you know, has been fascinating and has gone into all sorts of areas. Um, if there are two things I think we could perhaps mention, one is that you know, we can't blame COVID for some of the problems that we're discussing. Perhaps COVID has exacerbated some of the problems, but it's certainly not been the root cause. And when COVID has gone, some of those problems will be there and we'll need addressing. And the second thing that came through extraordinarily strongly, I would say, is youth. Um, Africa is the youngest continent in the world. Youth is engaged, youth is talented, youth is now connected, increasingly urban, not that that's everything, but increasingly urban and connected. And some of the brightest, best ideas that we're going to see are going to come from people like Abby and people of his um, uh, age. Um, as Mo said, it's time for some of the old ideas and maybe some of the old people um, to, uh, to stand aside. But there is hope there. There is optimism. And amid all this gloom, I think I would really like, if possible, to end on that note. And so I will. Thank you very much. Zainab. Thank you. Thank you so much indeed, David. And I'm glad you've ended on a slightly up note because uh, we mustn't forget that 2019 was the standout year for the youth of Africa because in the Sudan, I know there are all sorts of issues now, but the youth of Sudan were really instrumental in removing um, a long-term uh, you know, dictator from power. So the youth 
Abby and all those people like you, you know, the power is with you and the zeitgeist is with you. So I found that fascinating, really. And also what you said, Mo, about um, the importance of making sure that the army doesn't come back into politics, because although the days of the president in a palace may not be there, but army supported regimes are still very much the norm, really, in Africa. But thank you all very much indeed. It was a fascinating and very insightful discussion. So now, after a short break, we're going to come back with Mo, but this time he's going to be in a one-to-one -one conversation with Charles Michel. So don't go away. Just go and have a quick cup of tea, but then come back. Okay. See you shortly.